Hebrews chapter 7. We'll pick up reading at verse number 4. Uh, in the message, in fact, I started this a few weeks ago, simply entitled More About Melchizedek. More About Melchizedek, part number 3. This reading is a little bit thick. ever been in a blackberry patch, you ain't going to get no berries unless you get in where it's thick. Amen? Some of y'all are thinking, what are they talking about? <laughs> Not a telephone, I promise you. <laughs> 7-4, book of Hebrews. Consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily, they that are the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they came out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted for them, of course Melchizedek, received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Without all contradiction, the less Abraham is blessed of the better, Melchizedek. Here men that die receive tithes, but there he receives them of whom it is witness that he lives. And, as I may so say, Levi also who received tithes paid tithes in Abraham. For he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it's evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident for that after the similitude of Melchizedek there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment but after the power of an endless life. For he testifies, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment, going before the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. The law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw near unto God. And inasmuch as not without an oath, he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath. But this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better covenant, they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. But this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I'll stop our reading there for today. If you recall, the Apostle Paul had introduced Jesus of Nazareth as the high priest of the Christian faith. Some of y'all may be thinking, what in the world difference does this make? Uh, is this just some sort of head baggage to carry around? No, no, no. It's God's Word, and it's by hearing God's Word that faith results. Okay? If we walk closer with God, this is the kind of stuff we need here high priest of the Christian faith in 217, 31, 414, 415, and 55. The reason I mention that is to try and help us understand 
if you were a Jewish listener and the apostle presents five times in five chapters Jesus as the great high priest this would present a major difficulty for you. Simply stated, we've already got a high priest. And when he dies, we've already got his successor picked out. And if you follow this, you've got to be sure and get this to understand the context. Now, another question, do you suppose that this might have anything at all to do with the fact that every time Jesus in his earthly ministry encountered any resistance, every time any of the apostles encountered any resistance, there were always priests in the crowd. Okay. Priest. Jesus is priest? Wait. File that away for future. Next, the Apostle Paul has reintroduced, if you will, this Old Testament Bible character, Melchizedek. Chapter 5, verse 6 and verse 10. Verse 11 of chapter 5, Paul says that speaking of this Melchizedek, now maybe some of you can appreciate this like I can. Paul says, of whom we have many things to say and they're hard to be uttered. Literally, you could translate that, we have much to lay forth before you, but it'll be difficult to explain. Anybody? I heard somebody say, Melchizedek, was that the cat that uh, uh, made the movie about the passion of Christ? No, that was Mel Gibson. <laughs> Some of you all get that. Verse 11, chapter 5, Paul told why that was. You're dull of hearing. And if you call, simply stated, you're lazy hearers of God's Word. This is going to sound like a pot shop, but it's not really. If you're hearing me this morning thinking, I don't care about Melchizedek. I don't care what the Bible says about Melchizedek. not interested in Melchizedek. I've already heard all about Melchizedek that I care to hear then guess what? You're being tempted as I speak to be a lazy hearer of God's Word. Mm. Just that simple. It's amazing to me how the further we go in God's book, if you'll pay attention to what He says, He lays it out right in front of us so that you cannot miss it. You can't miss it. If you tried to, you couldn't. Well, What's taking place then, if that's the case, you're being tempted, as the Hebrews there were, not to appreciate the Word of God. You remember Eve in the garden? She was being tempted to think that just because God said it, it don't apply to me. You ever thought that? Can you appreciate that line of reasoning? It's in the Bible, but you see, since I'm not interested, it, it really don't matter to me in my life. Y'all were, were growing up in a society where if it doesn't directly help me, I'm not interested in it. Uh, this is deeply spiritual, but those of you who know me can appreciate why I say this. We are in food line yesterday in the aisles, I don't know what, eight feet across. And in the center of the aisle is a big cart that just brought up out of the freezer for all the goods they're stocking the shelves with. Along comes some skinny little woman pushing a cart. She leaves it over on the uh, one side of the aisle. So now we've got a three-foot buggy and a three-foot cart full of frozen stuff. And then she shops on the other side. So this one 92-pound woman has uh, <laughs> completely shut down this aisle. You know, can you imagine? When, I'm thinking to myself, did it ever dawn on you that there are other people in here who like to shop on this aisle? Obviously, no. But you know, it's the way we're being trained to think. And I, and I wish it won't so, but it's, it's, it's like this with the Word of God. But just because it's in the Bible don't mean it's for me. Can I pop your bubble? Disciple, if it's in the Bible, number one, God said it. Number two, it's for you. And number three, it will help you. Melchizedek who? Yeah. Get in there and dig, man. God's not 
one like me. God just don't have hot air. He likes to blow off. <laughs> God's got something good to say. So you remember 6.3, Paul promises that he's going to explain more about Melchizedek. In fact, a literal reading of the second part of that verse is, if God will turn this thing over, if God will turn this thing over, if God can affect change in my thinking and in your thinking, Paul says, I'm going to be able to explain to you more about this character Melchizedek. And that's what chapter 7 is. Start to finish, more about Melchizedek. Now, one real clue here given to us in our text this morning as to how not to be a lazy hearer on the subject of Melchizedek, let me turn your attention to chapter 7, verse 4, the word consider. Now consider how great this man was unto whom the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth. Now we already recognized from previous message that Abraham doing this recognized deity or he wouldn't be giving him tithe. But the word consider uh, mispronounced something like this, theoreo, uh, it literally translates to look closely at and discern. To look closely at and to discern. It comes from a word that means to be a spectator. To be a spectator. Now think about this with me, if you will. You just paid $50 for a ticket to go to a football game. Do you, Thayereo, do you look closely at, do you consider what's going on out there on that field? Well, I guess as you would, unless you're Keith and it's a Redskin game. <laughs> uh, do you get the point? Cost you some cash? I'm going to pay attention. How about uh, you just paid $100 uh, to go to a uh, NASCAR race? Now let me just pick your brain. Do you reckon that you're going to do any theoreo? Are you going to do any looking closely at? Paying attention to? Are you going to be a spectator? Well, I would think obviously yes. Why? Because you paid a high price just to be there and look. That's the whole point. It's interesting that this same word is used when we're being told what a group of women disciples did during Jesus' crucifixion, Matthew 27, 55, they stood at a distance, <coughs> beholding. Same word translated differently, theoreo. And don't you know, y'all, that those women were paying very close attention to what they saw in a distance, their Lord, their Master, the one they were benefiting with their means for three years has been crucified. Are you getting the drift then of this word consider? It's as if Paul is saying, now look, be a spectator of what I'm trying to describe to you. Look closely at the little bit of evidence we have in the Word of God about the, who this character Melchizedek is. You see, as disciples, as students of the Bible, as those who, as Paul said to Timothy, rightly divide the word of truth, it's our lot to take everything we find in the Bible as we find it and fit the pieces together. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, laid in a manger by a virgin mother. Amen? Yes. There are those who maintain, well, since the Bible says that, then there's no way He could be God, because God couldn't begin. Well, the fact is, y'all, the Bible says something else in addition to that. He was from everlasting to everlasting. Right? And countless other things. That child uh, in the uh, a uh, 9-6 Isaiah that's to be born uh, is going to be Almighty God. Amen. His disciples, it's our lot 
to take what we're learning and to put the pieces together. That's the only way we can ever come up with a whole, if you will. Paul referred to this mystery of godliness. There's some things in this book, y'all, that's a mystery. Mm -hmm. And the only way we figure it out is about like Sherlock Holmes used to do, one clue at a time. That's what we're being instructed to do. Let me ask you then, having said that, what was the last thing that Jesus said from the cross? Say again. It is finished. Some of you are probably wondering. There are several things said, but that's right. The very last thing, according to the record that he said, John 19.30, it is finished. Next question. What immediately happened after Jesus said this and then gave up the ghost? What immediately happened after he said, it is finished, and gave up his ghost? Anybody? Anybody? Turned off. Turned off. Pretend you're at the NASCAR race. Don't be ashamed to speak up. What I'm looking for is this. Back over in the temple, what happened? The veil ran. The veil ran. From the top to the bottom. Glad Carol pointed that out. With all else that's being communicated there, and I'm sure it's more than I'll ever figure out down here, what we're being shown is change. Change. Anybody here like change? I know those who speak of, brag about, as if they like change, uh, that works some of the time. All change, nobody likes. I've been around too many folks. It's been suggested that this veil, heavy veil, uh, could have been inches thick. As soon as it was torn from the top to the bottom, obviously letting us know who was behind it, Someone probably appointed a committee to get that thing repaired. That wasn't what was called for. You know the irony here, y'all? <clears throat> Don't know this for a fact. Most scholars though agree. Do you know that behind that veil, the Ark of the Covenant wasn't there? It had been gone for years. Nobody knew where it was. Last time it was ever seen and recorded was when Nebuchadnezzar and his whores wiped Jerusalem clean like a dish. But rather than change anything, when we build this new temple at Herod's expense, we're still going to put up that veil. Want us all know, hopefully, that there ain't nothing behind it. Change. Change from this point on. Life with God, because of this cross, is all going to change. <laughs> the obvious and first point would be one, everybody sees inside the veil now there is no ark. The, the secret's out, if you will. Number two, because of what's just happened on the cross, this business about whosoever will could come right into the presence of God. And somebody said, well, wait a minute, I thought that was just the priest. Well, it was, but no more. Yeah. Change. <laughs> and then if that's not bad enough, What's the next thing we read, at least chronologically, within a matter of just a few days, we find ourselves in Acts chapter 2. You remember what happened? God the Spirit came down on the entire assembly of saints. God got in every Christian. Christ within us. The hope of glory. Somebody says, oh, wait a minute. As a student of the Bible, I thought that that was only for the prophets of old or for the judges of old. Yes, that's true until now because now everything has changed. Amen. You see, as Bible students, as we're coming to realize when Jesus said, it is finished, He wasn't only talking about dying and the end of His earthly life. 
He wasn't only talking about coming to the end of His time of suffering and humiliation. When we as Bible students, as we're coming to realize that when Jesus said, it is finished, then all of a sudden what we've learned over in the book of Galatians, in fact, verse 3, or excuse me, chapter 3, verse number 24, is literally coming to pass. We're told there, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. <coughs> now you've got to be old, like me, if you've ever heard or can remember the word schoolmaster. Schoolmaster. Uh, that was a descriptive term. Uh, it described what went on in the schoolhouse. When I'm at school, I got a master. And you say, well, how do I know which one it is? It's the one with a stick. <laughs> Some of y'all aren't old enough to remember that. Uh, all you remember is child abuse. What I remember is, if I say sound shut up, that's exactly what I mean. What? Some of y'all look old enough and you just not want to help me. Right? <laughs> God says, as we learn this book, the entire book of the law, 39 books, if you will, served as a schoolmaster to show us Jesus. Amen. Jesus. Melchizedek. Now, the Old Testament, ripe with shadows, pictures, types. His disciples were learning, they all point to Christ. Everything. Genesis chapter 1. You remember, uh, in fact, we studied that some time back. Uh, the Bible says, the King James says, uh, in the beginning, God, uh, if you're at all familiar with the text there, it's the... Uh, the Hebrew word translated Elohim, which is God plural. People are thinking, oh, pantheism. No, Trinitarianism. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. Elohim. God plural. God created the heaven and the earth. John chapter 1. We're told everything that was created. Jesus was there in the process of the creation. What an amazing coincidence. No, you know, no coincidence. These Old Testament books, if you will, of the law, were given to us to prepare us for Christ. Christ was not a second thought. Christ was not plan B. Uh, Christ was not when supper gets burned, you go to McDonald's. Christ was it from the get-go. Scripture says from before the foundation of the world, He was crucified slain from before the... What in the world? And I thought this was God's way of fixing what got broke. Oh. The Old Testament, full of pictures and types, all pointing us to Jesus. Already mentioned, Abraham paid tithe to Melchizedek. He recognized him as God. That's God's money. Amen? Amen. The priests were told in Hebrews 7 here, through Abraham, though still in his loins, paying tithes to Melchizedek, represents to us as them recognizing they had a superior. There really was a great high priest that they didn't know anything at all yet about, but there's the shadow in the Old Testament. David prophesies about Melchizedek, Psalm 110, some 500 years after Moses' law was written. In so doing, recognizing that the Levitical priesthood, the Old Testament priesthood, it was not perfect. It was weak. It was unprofitable. Now remember y'all, this is what's being told to a group of Hebrew folk, Hebrew believers, who are not real sure about this Jesus character to start with. Anybody here recognize the fact that God never beats around the bush? Somebody said God would not make a good politician. 
He don't know how to smooth folks. He don't know how to gently creep up on somebody before he drops a bomb on them. Good night, y'all. Listen, priests, in the writing of this book and all prior to that, priests were priests because of who their daddy was. Your daddy could be a priest and be good. You could be priest and be a bum. You ever remember a fellow by the name of Eli? Eli had two sons that were both priests. And guess what? They were bums. And, but it didn't matter. Because in the economy going on then, you got to be priest just because your daddy was a priest. How many of you here maybe have known a businessman, a dad, passed his business on to his son? Wrong thing to do. Right? Well, I know somebody right now uh, passed business on to two or three sons, and the business he worked 50 years to build and make extremely uh, successful has gone down the tubes in 20 years. Don't you guess he was real glad he had done that? <laughs> no, they were priests because their daddy was a priest. Secondly, the priest would always change every time one other priest died. Uh, you come to church as it were, uh, this Sunday, and in the meantime, uh, the priest you went to see, he's dead, but his replacement is immediately there. No campaigning done. And then thirdly, it's pointed out that the priest also, here from chapter 7, uh, they had to daily bring in sacrifices for both themselves and for the people that they represented. That's the priest. Now listen, just a quick word cutting to the chase. Aren't you glad that the priesthood uh, from uh, the book of Malachi heading back to the left 39 chapters, aren't you glad that thing still isn't in, in force? Yeah. Well, Paul goes on to help us realize just how grateful we ought to be. In verse number 22, we're told, they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. Guess what? That's not the case with Jesus anymore. Amen? Aren't you glad? Verse number 24, This man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. You don't ever have to worry about someone that you didn't know up until now being the one who's going to take over in the tag team match. Alright? And then verse number 25, because of this, he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. I thought it was interesting, the word translated uttermost there literally means full-ended. It means entire, and it also means completion. Now what Paul is telling us then about this Melchizedek character that seems to be an enigma, this Melchizedek that Jesus is now fitting the bill for, this priest, since he doesn't die, is going to be able to save folks all the way to the end. How many of you in here have been walking with Christ for more than 10 years? Anybody? How many in here have been walking with Christ for more than 25 years? How many of you in here are walking with Christ and plan to do so to the day you die? Y'all, He's going to be with you no matter what comes your way. Save to the uttermost those that come to God by Him. You don't ever have to worry about Him losing your records. You're going to think I spent all day at food line yesterday. Almost the same one. Got up to the counter, racked all the groceries out, gave them a little plastic card. You know. The little machine told him that everything's cool. He had enough money in his account to cover this. Handed me my card back and said, Sorry, we can't give you no receipt. First thing out of Lily's mouth, she's the accountant. Did they debit your account? I said, uh, yeah. Well, coincidentally, they didn't give me no receipt. Well, there was a glitch in the computer. 
Don't, don't you love computers? <laughs> Y'all got to see it from my standpoint. Who knows what they did in their little box yesterday? <laughs> they had my card, access to my cash, and said, sorry, we can't give you a, 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 a record of it. Does that matter? I'm thinking to myself, yes. <laughs> evidently to you it don't. <laughs> to me it do. Y'all, I think I told you some time back, speaking of the, the impersonalness of somebody losing your records, got a call, hello. Well, I'm your insurance man. My day is brightened up already. <laughs> I'd like to know if you'd like to take out auto policy with our company. Because I see you got a house policy, wind policy, squirrel policy, whatever other policy. I said, man, we've had auto policy with you folks for like 40 years. <laughs> <laughs> and then as he hung up, I said to him, yeah, actually to the receiver, that's why I love you insurance people so good. It's this personal touch. I've had insurance with Farm Bureau since before you were born, Leroy. And now you're going to try. Don't you just love me? Got the car over to the shop the other day. The guy says, listen, this comes under your extended warranty. He said, my experience has been when you buy an extended warranty, it comes with hamburgers and fries <laughs> until you make a claim. Then they don't know you. Have you ever been there? You're thinking, what a blessing. What a blessing to just fall between the cracks and the easy answer for everybody is, sorry, the computer man, I didn't get interested in no computer. Who cares why? How did this happen? Y'all, that will never happen with God. Amen. And listen, you say, well, well, I know that, but I just ain't sure why. This is why. And that's why you can go to 25-7 Hebrews and find out about this character Melchizedek and understand there's a basis for my faith. I really can't have confidence that until I get to the end, he'll always be there. But did you notice what he's doing? Making intercession. Mm -hmm. Yo, I can't get this. So this is so far beyond me. And we all know what intercession is. It's praying for other folks. We do that on Wednesday night. We do that practically every time we pray. God, old so-and-so is in a bind. I don't know how that works. I don't even know why God does it, but it's in the book. So that's why we can say, oh, so-and-so needs something, God. Would you hear me on his account? You say, yeah, but are you sure it works? Yeah, I'm sure it works. You say, How are you sure? Genesis 18. Abraham prays for Lot. You recall? Uh, he never mentions him by name, but the implication goes on for about 15 verses. God, what if there's righteous people down in Sodom? You're going to destroy the bad, the good with the bad? And God says, no. And then it's as if Abraham starts kicking around in the dirt. Well, there may not be a whole lot of righteous people. What if they ain't but 50 there? 45. But what if they ain't but 10 there? God says, hey, yeah, I got you covered. And then come chapter 19. Do you remember Lot? And God was fixing to change some things in his life. And he too was dragging his feet. But the Bible specifically points out the angels took him by the hand and his wife by the hand and his daughters by the hand and pulled them out of Sodom. You remember what it said after that? Because, because, because God was having mercy on Abraham because, or on Lot rather, because Abraham had prayed for him. You know anybody today who's in need of a touch of mercy from God Almighty? I heard, uh, I believe it was Adrian Rogers, Miss Ann, that's way better. Where's Miss Ann? In the nursery. Poor soul. <laughs> Adrian Rogers, way back, made the statement. Asked, in fact, posed the question Do you think that God really does hear the prayers of a parent for a child in need? As soon as I heard it, my ears pricked up. 
don't know where you're going with this, but if there's anything there, I need it. Anybody? Pastor Rogers went on to say, do you remember the boy demon-possessed in his childhood? Threw himself in the fire, threw himself in the water, ruining his life. Remember what Jesus told Daddy? Well, get your son to repent. Get your son to start coming to church. Get your son to start reading his Bible. Any of the above? Uh-uh. Remember what he told him? Anything is possible if you will believe. You. Then he said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. And guess what? Junior got delivered. Is that music to anybody else's ears besides mine? Amen. That's intercession, y'all. That's somehow God listening to another or someone else. Does it work? It sure do. Why? I don't know. I don't know how it's going to work. But if that ain't bad enough, we've got, we're told here, Jesus, the great high priest, making intercession for you and me till the day we die. Amen. Could that be so? Well, sure it could if that's what the Bible says. Amen? Amen. Somebody said, do you really believe that Jonah swallowed that whale? I got some of you. I ain't gonna be. <laughs> Listen, if the book said it, it's so. So not only are we not going to get lost in the cracks and be lost because of some computer glitch, to the uttermost we're going to be saved, but that's because to the uttermost He'll be praying for you and praying for me. Uh, so obvious it doesn't need anything else said, but I can't let that one go but just for a moment. Jesus praying for me. Jesus praying for you. Well, he probably makes a blanket prayer, amen. I pray for all them Baptists down there. I pray for all them Baptist preachers down there. I pray for all them Baptist preachers that ain't doing like they ought to be. I pray for all them Baptist preachers not doing like they ought to be doing. Who struggles every single day. None of the above. Scripture says that He not only knows me by name, but He called me by name. That applies to you too. Amen. Amen. Scripture says that He's got us etched on the palm of His hand. Mm -hmm. If you don't believe the Bible is the Word of God, i got nothing for you. But if you do, what that tells me is, not only is my name etched on the palm of His hand, my name that He's known, He called me before I was born. He wrote it there, it could have been the angels, but it's God's book, and my name's there. So he doesn't pray like a load of buckshot when it comes time to pray for Roland. He mentions me by name. Now if that's true, that could even make a Baptist get happy. If it's not, that would explain some of the rest of us. <laughs> Y'all, you know why we're going to make it to the end? Sure, it's because I'm such a good Christian and I'm going to persevere and I'm going to sweat and I'm going to grunt. No. It's because Jesus is going to wear God out. Praying for you. Let me close with this. No hands, obviously. You know what it's like to have a child in a dangerous spot. A dangerous spot. They're old enough to know better. They've been taught better. When you pray for them, is it a cold, dead, please hurry up prayer? Or maybe you can relate to some of the Old Testament Bible characters who were told that they grabbed hold of the horns of the altar. That altar was where the animal was killed. And that animal being killed is what erased the marks between God and me. Mm -hmm. 
So when catfish grabbed hold of the horns of the altar, he was making sure, God, what we just did, I am not going to let you or anybody else forget about it. Imagine then Jesus praying for you, his child, the way that you have prayed for that wandering child of yours. To me, that's kind of nice. I don't know how it works, y'all, and I don't know why he'd do it. But when Paul said, I want to show you some more about Melchizedek, I'm real glad that he did it. Because there he is, y'all, verse number 25. To the uttermost, saving us. To the uttermost, interceding for us. Because of who he is. Not because of who I am. You're here this morning and you've never given your life to Christ. Can I be plain uh, with you? Why would that be? Are you waiting for a better offer? Can you find someone who would do more for you? It's so easy, even as Bible believers, to, to live with what Jesus has already done. And that's a good thing. Thank God for Calvary. You know, it's because of Calvary that he's doing what he's doing right now. And will continue to do so. The insurance salesman's marketing ploy is, I can talk you into investing your money now for the return you'll get one day. You'll forgive me for saying it like this. The marketing scheme of the Word of God is, if you'll invest your life now, you're fixing to be rewarded both now and forevermore. You've never come to Christ. I'm going to ask you to come. I mean, what have you got to lose? The struggling, the anxiety, the uncertainty about what you can't see, all can be gone. You're here today and you're a believer, but you're living at arm's distance. Why would that be? What has God ever done to offend you? I say both of those just to get to this point. It can be changed right now. Amen. You can walk away from here today knowing that your life is all that it could possibly be. With a future that cannot be described. I'm going to ask you to pray with me.